explain to you how you get your three major body cavities that are in your thorax and your abdomen, which are your uh, pericardial cavity, your pleural cavity, and your peritoneal cavity. And your pleural it says you have two, I don't know, I don't know, you have two peritoneal cavities, you have two lungs. But anyway, so this is supposed to be a top-down view of your mesoderm at the very beginning of where we started, so the very first view we ever had when the umbilical ring was about to start forming. Okay, and you have this, so let me go back. Sorry, I'm being Thomas right now. All right, so this view right here, he's looking at the red layer instead of the blue one. So the blue one is when he showed you the umbilical ring forming right there, but instead of looking at the blue layer, he's looking at the red one, okay? And you have this red layer, which is the germ. You have all these structures. So you have this intramuralic seal, uh, you have an extra neural ceiling, which is essentially just like a cavity next to where the mesoderm is. And then you have your notochord, your mesoderm, your colloidal membrane, your orofaryngeal membrane, okay? And then there's a connection between the extra embryonic and the intraembryonic ceiling, and it's this opening right here. And so the next page I have, so I took this. He, he mentioned this in class, so this is supposed to be a cut that shows you this, okay? Does that make sense, everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you got this, so you can see here would be like right here. So front right row is right now. Here would be like right there. Make sense? Okay. So this just shows you. I really don't even know what he's trying to show you. He just shows you from a section of the stuff before he goes on explaining like what forms what. And then here's another example of the same thing. It's just he cut it further back to where the connection itself is open. So you have a connection between these two. Okay. There's no separation between extra and intra. I guess this got moved over when I converted to PowerPoint. But uh, this was this. So this thing right here, the intraumbral axillum, is kind of confusing, but this is supposed to be a space that's lateral to this cavity. So you see this cavity and this like tube and this connection and stuff. This is supposed to be a little bit lateral to it, and there's another one on the other side. Okay, they're connected, but they're they're lateral to the actual thing itself. And this shows you. He just points it out more, um, and he he like asked you a question in class about like what causes the oropharyngeal membrane to bend. Uh, to be posterior to the uh, anterior coelom. So this is supposed to be the anterior coelom, this is posterior, right, they're just cavities. And the reason why is because you went so anteriorly, like when you were forming, that you bent anteriorly, so you bent forward basically, that your mouth ended up behind where the hole itself is, even though originally you started out and it was just flat. Does that make sense? So originally you started off flat, and then you started bending downward like this. So you went anteriorly, and you don't have any space to go forward anymore, so you just went down. I might ask that same question again. That's a, he asks that question all the time. I don't know why it matters so much, but Neurologist. All right, so this is just stuff labeled, start to label like what's gonna become what. Here's septum transversum, here's the heart tube, presents a pericardial cavity, that's just, you know. Uh, pericardial, peritoneal canals, so these are the canals that are gonna connect between your thorax and your abdomen that get closed off by your diaphragm. And then this is your presumptive peritoneal cavity, it's supposed to be right here, this posterior part of the uh, intraembryonic coelom, okay? So essentially all the stuff that we're gonna talk about came from the intraembryonic coelom and the extra one didn't make any of this stuff, okay? I think that's the, like the main point he's trying to wrap up with all this stuff. But I took this and cut it where this is supposed to be, okay? So this is the transverse section of this guy right here and it's transversely cut and this is before I ended it, I took a screenshot of it, but this is, this presumptive pericardial cavity is supposed to go with this arrow. It messes up the little text when you convert it to PowerPoint, it's weird. But all this stuff's still labeled the same as the other slide. And this shows you septum transversum, what looks like in a transverse section. Here's your gut tube. So I purposely cut it like right there where his, he cut it also. So that's why you don't see any of the uh, vitellin duct or any of the yolk sac in this cut, right? Because this is in front of where the yolk sac is, okay? So here's your gut tube. Uh, here's your pericardial peritoneal canals. And these are the ones that you are going to close off when you form the actual diaphragm itself like entirely. Um, so septum transversum is the first like part of your liver, I guess, or not, 
it is party number, but it's the first party document that forms, I guess you would think of it that way. Okay, so he mentioned, so here's the same thing, it's just cut from a different area. So that was, so this is anterior to the um, yolk sac, and this is posterior to the yolk sac, okay? So this is gonna become your, like, anterior to, so this area right here, so anterior where this cut is, this is gonna become your lung and thorax. Posteriors are right here. This is gonna become your abdomen, okay? Here's your mid gut, so mid gut, hind gut. Your foregut extends upward like this, and it'll eventually become, so your foregut right here will eventually become, you know, the stuff we dissected out of your stomach, because I don't know how it gets down there, but it gets down there somehow, but some of this will become your actual thorax. And I think that's a question in one of the review books, is like, where's your thorax come from? Like foregut gives you some of this, but. Um, so he just mentioned that the gut tube is contained within peritoneal cavity, and that's pericardio of peritoneal canals. Uh, and then he just shows you that the gut tube itself sitting inside the intra embryonic ceiling. So he mentions that in class a lot. So that's pretty important, I think. And, okay. So then he mentions the fact that the gut tube is suspended by the dorsal mesentery. So this dorsal mesentery is what eventually becomes your actual mesentery that you see whenever you are dissecting in your intestines. And most of your intestines are connected to this like nasty yellow stuff that was attached to like your posterior like abdominal wall, right? That's where that came from, dorsal mesentery. Uh, and he mentions this as formed by fusion of two layers of parietal mesoderm. So I mean, you guys saw on the first test, like most of this stuff isn't gonna be like reason out your way to the answer, it's just gonna be like a straight fact. Like the embryo, they kinda just give you like fact questions for some reason. I, mean, I guess it's easier that way, but um, yeah, I mean, I can see them asking a question like, you know, what forms your mesentery and we dorsal mesentery or like what forms your uh, falciform ligament, that'd be your ventral mesentery. So that kind of stuff, I feel like they could ask for stuff like that. Okay, so so he's gonna, so he goes from this, which is essentially like the end of week four, and he's like, how do you get your thorax and your abdomen? So then this is where he starts talking about your thorax first. So this picture right here is a transverse section of, it's this section basically, but more anterior to this. Okay, so this picture is more anterior, so this is closer to your head than the other picture was. Okay, and he's showing you all this stuff, how it's working. Anthony talks about lung buds and how they start developing and they like push out, and that's pretty much all he said about it. That's all you, I think you need to know is basically about lung. But you have these like thorough pericardial folds, and the nice thing about all this stuff is that they kind of tell you what they are. So you have like thorough pericardial, so they're near your lungs and near your heart. Uh, this is pericardial peritoneal, so it's like between your like thorax, heart area, and your abdomen is any connection. Um, these are gonna get sealed off if you go inferiorly, like so if you go, I guess, posteriorly at this point. So if you go posteriorly at this point, because this thing is laying, it's developing like, like, like they talk about like lizards and stuff, but it's like laying, so ventral's down here, dorsal's up here. So posterior is into the screen and then anterior is out of the screen. And so these things are connect, would connect to the abdominal cavity if there uh, wasn't a, a diaphragm there, basically. Okay? So, and then it says presumptive pericardial cavity right here. The heart tube itself becomes your heart. He has like a, a slide that says like face. There's like three things on there. But he talks about the fact that these are gonna come together and close, and then your lungs themselves are gonna push outward. And then this area right here, I have it labeled on the next slide, uh, is gonna push downward, and it's gonna fuse with these two thorough pericardial folds, and that's how you get to of the uh, pleural cavity, okay? So if you look at this next slide, I have it labeled right here. So he calls it the base of lung growth. I don't know if there's an actual name for it, but he mentions it briefly in class. Here's the base of lung growth, and I have it labeled here, these two will fuse to make two separate pleural cavities. So this and this, when these two things fuse, will form a line that looks like that. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's pretty much, I don't know if there's anything he would ask about that other than like, you know, what forms your pleural cavities, maybe like base of lung, forms through a pericardial membrane. This stuff's not as like discreet as the previous embryo was. This is more of like understanding, I guess. The stuff Ben will talk about is gonna be like super, super high yield. Like cardio is gonna have as much, like 25% of cardio is gonna be pretty much embryo questions, ridiculous. Unless they change it, that's how it was our year at least. So, okay. So these things right here, left and right, are gonna be your lungs. This right here is your fibrous pericardium. This is your heart itself. Um, so this is your pericardial cavity right here. It's labeled pericardial cavity. And then here's your pleural cavity. Okay. On. There you go. Oops. And then this is separation of the thorax from the abdominal cavity.
diagram itself. So you have your septum transversum, which is going to become your diaphragm, part of your diaphragm. Uh, and then you have your pericardial, uh, peritoneal canals themselves. You just think I was talking about earlier that they wouldn't be uh, connected to the abdomen if it wasn't for your diaphragm eventually forming, which it does, and it closes it off. And so you'll have these like pleuroperitoneal folds that start off from the dorsal part. So I relate the dorsal ventral here, as we mentioned on this slide. So the dorsal ventral, these pleuroperitoneal folds will start pushing outward uh, towards the ventral area, and they're eventually going to fuse with your septum transversum and they are going to close off and make an entire uh, pleuroperitoneal membrane. So there are folds before, there are membranes now. I don't think that matters, but in case no confusion, they're the same thing. It's just now they're formed. And here's your dorsal mesentery again. So this is going to be from your digestive system at some point. And here's your septum transversum. Uh, he has it labeled on another slide, like what all this stuff becomes. And it says right here, fusion of uh, pleuroperitoneal membranes with septum transversum and dorsal mesentery form the primordial diaphragm. So here's the last part of the formation of the diaphragm, which is that your pleuroperitoneal membranes are fused. Uh, so things are starting to differentiate. You have this muscular peripheral rim, which he mentioned in a lecture. He doesn't have labels. So I labeled down here. Uh, it's from. He says it's from migratory myoblast. So I can ask. I can see him asking a question, like where did your central tendon come from? If you said the transverse or like where did your muscular peripheral rim come from? From migratory myoblast. Uh, dorsal mesentery is the origination of your cura. I can see him asking questions like that. So that's that. And then he mentioned the fact that your diaphragm comes from different spinal levels, but I thought this was really confusing that he used this picture because he, I don't know, did he, I don't remember if he drew the point home or not, but uh, he was talking about like somites themselves. So like the somites that form this stuff come from these levels. So the somites from C3, C5 will eventually make your diaphragmatic muscle and your uh, central tendon. Your outer rib muscle will come from somites that came from C7 to C12. And then your cura will come from lumbar segments that came from L1 and L3. This makes perfect sense because this is where the cura themselves are sitting, and this is where they are like making the loops for like the uh, aortic high. Uh, aortic, is it highest for the aorta? I'm not sure. I know it is for the esophagus, but uh, there's a hole that's in your diaphragm against the posterior abdominal wall, basically, that one of the cura makes, and it's in this area. So that makes sense. The outer rib muscle, this kind of makes sense too because. Um, it's like the lowest yield that dad will ever ask you this question, or anyone will, but part of your diaphragm is innervated by your costal nerves, and so it makes sense that it's between C7 and C12, and then your phrenic nerve, which comes from the same area that most of your diaphragm comes from, comes from C3, C5, so that kind of makes sense. Kind of goes with the theme of like innervation and stuff. And then the last slide, I think, is just congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Uh, very, I forget the word they use, but it's like incompatible with life, I think they say it all the time. So you can't live with this, so you have Bad problems. You essentially just have like all your stuff turning into your thoracic cavity. It's not good. Uh, and yeah, so. Does anyone have any questions about any of the first lecture? It's, it's super dense, but uh, it's not as high yield as the other lectures are in terms of like questions. More likely, we'll ask you questions about like heart and general defects or like the origination or something. What is a heart problem with this one structure? Where they come from? That kind of stuff. Most likely type of question I'll ask you. He could ask you anything from this lecture, but uh, I just feel like this stuff is way more in depth to the scope of the class. This is like, I mean, I don't really understand it at all. I just like regurgitated what he said and, like, <laughs> and, put, and put some like.